What's up, New Money Gang? Today, we speak to an expert in real estate who makes over $20,000 a month. Wow. So now, if you're trying to get into the real estate game, you're obviously going to want to pay attention because there's a lot of really good information that he's going to be dropping, some really good nuggets. Stick around for the whole video. Learn about Airbnb, short-term rentals, and flipping. All right, let's get into that interview. All right, we are here today with David Runnebaum, a real estate expert. David, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you've been doing in real estate, and you know what you think you're most experienced in. Yeah, hey guys. Um, yeah, my name is David. I've actually, right out of college, jumped into real estate, uh, which, which I was the bottom of the market, ironically, in 2008. I started buying foreclosures and ended up wholesaling, which led to flipping and rental portfolio and all kind of stuff. And this is my 14th year investing, you know, buying and selling. And I've actually started buying out of state too. I bought two projects in North Carolina, um, which led me to your channel because of the one that you guys are, are looking at too. Um, so it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, Go ahead, Justin. Why don't you? I was going to say, you know, when you when you kind of preface it where you hit the market in 2018 when there was the big financial collapse, knowing what we know now, uh, and maybe we can get into this a little bit deeper later in the interview, but knowing what we know now and what's expected with the foreclosure markets, are you just kind of chomping at the bit to see what's going to happen, you know, later this year, early next year with the with the housing markets and prices? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um you know, early on when I was buying in 2008, I, my mind was blown as a young investor, like how cheap these houses were. You know, I was buying houses in good areas for, you know, 70, 80, 90, a hundred thousand that could rent out for top dollar. And now the prices I've gotten insane. However, with the foreclosures, like you just mentioned, um, the eviction ban has been you know in place for a long time so yeah there will be foreclosures coming through the pipeline but there's a lot of investors like myself that are waiting for at least a small dip so we don't have to pay these high prices of what we've got going on now the other challenge that i see is the market is so inflated right that these people have so much equity built into their houses at the moment so I, it's hard to say how many foreclosures there would be if you know what yeah, I'm saying. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I actually yeah. didn't even think about that, but that does make a ton of sense. Yeah, they can survive so, a lot longer and take out second mortgages if they needed to even. Yeah, so like a lot of people that were buying, you know, two years ago, pre-pandemic, um, maybe they lost their jobs. However, their, their properties probably went up 100 Gs in value, right? So who knows if they're going to get foreclosed on or they'll just, you know, sell it and break even. So it's really hard to tell, you know, what's going to come in the next, you know, six months. Um, I don't know if there'll be a correction, but I, I don't think it'll be as hot as it's been the past, you know, 18 months. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I see it like being like a 20% drop. That's my guess, just because I kind of agree. I think a, there's a lot of investors just waiting to scoop up property. Um, so And there's like super inflation going on right now anyways, and we're seeing money being put into other assets and we do a lot with Bitcoin and stuff like that. A lot of money is going into there. Um, and so people are just trying to get out of cash. So, you know, I don't I don't see I see a, a lot of buyers trying to scoop up a lot of property consistently for the next couple of years. I don't see a huge bubble like everyone is maybe hinting at. Um, obviously, anything could happen. But if there was a bubble to happen, what what how do you protect yourself against that? You were there right after you know, the last bubble broke. And I know, I actually know personally, several millionaires that went to zero because they were way over leveraged, owning way too many properties, and then they could not pay the notes on them in the downturn. So how, how do you protect yourself from a bubble if there is one? Well, I, th you know, thankfully, I'm actually way under leveraged. I have 26 rental properties, and I would say I probably have about maybe 10 mortgages on those 26 rentals, but most of them are 50% loan to value. So, you know, even if it did take a dip, I, you know, I, I would think I should be able to survive just fine. Most of the guys who held through it uh, obviously have done significantly better because the prices then are significantly higher now. So, um, yeah, it's just like if you bought, 
you know, the stock market and the stock market tanked. What if you held there now the stock market's up here? It's the same thing as real estate, right? So I think I would fare well if we did have a big bubble. Um, I don't see a bubble coming, but um, I think I think any, anything that hits the market, there's plenty of people on the sidelines that have money that want to get into the market. And I think everything's so, super inflated because a lot of people have money right now. That's true. And, but, and money is really easy to get at a cheap rate right now. That's kind of like, would you mm -hmm. like suggest against that if there could be a possible downturn? I mean, like if you're an investor, you know, you can get money pretty cheap. Um, but how much do you really want to like, if you're just starting out right now, is that a smart thing to do is, I mean, you can get cheap money. Like it almost make it's like a no brainer, but then are you really going to be protected if there is a 20%, 50% dip in the market? Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan in leveraging. I, I wouldn't be where I am today without leverage and mm -hmm. to, to, to buy a house or an investment property and borrow at 3% is like free. I can't, I can't fathom how free it is. And even if you stuck a tenant in there and you were just breaking even, you don't have to reach into your pocket to go pay the mortgage I and mean, you're still winning, right? Because somebody else is paying for that asset. So I would say, yeah, I, I'm still a big believer in borrowing, um, you know, even in today's market. So when you uh, like, you know, when you say that you've got, you know, your all of your properties, only ten of them have mortgages. Is that because, uh, as an individual investor, not a commercial investor, you can only have ten mortgages under your name before you have to get different uh, qualifications for lending? Well, yeah. So you hit it. You hit it on the head. You're allowed to have ten traditional mortgages. I do have some side mortgages that are private loans. Um, you know, with like interest only loans, five six percent. Um, just because I haven't maximized the, the 10 loans yet. The, the challenge in getting the 10 loans is right, is proof of income. I mean, we don't have to go down that road, but you know, when, when you go get the loan, you still have to prove that you can afford it. And nobody wants to pay Uncle Sam everything that they owe him. So um, there are challenges in getting 10 traditional, uh, you know, conventional loans. But along the way, I would save up cash and I would buy you know, whether I bought a townhouse or a single family, like, you know, so, some of the stuff I bought was 60, 70,000. I would just pay cash for it. Um, other stuff is in great neighborhoods where it's two, 300,000 and I would leverage it. So, I mean, it just, it just at that moment, whether I'm going to leverage it or not leverage it, but I am still a believer in leveraging for the rental because ultimately you're looking for somebody else to pay off that asset. It's not necessarily the cash flow that you're after. It's after somebody else paying for the asset. And if you get appreciation on top of it, that's just gravy. I, I, was, I was looking at some statistics and it's, you know, roughly about $800, $850 a month, they say, per unit for, you know, operating expenses. Is that something that you see? Um, and in doing so, do you do a lot of your management yourself or do you have a, a, a management company that handles a lot of the logistics of all of the, you know, rental property management for you? No, I, I manage all my own rentals. Uh, most of the stuff I have is single family and then I have small building that's eight units and 12 units. Um, but they're kind of on autopilot. You know, once I renovate the properties and I put, you know, top line tenants in, I make sure they have first, last and security, that they have good job history. And, you know, because it's already renovated, then they really shouldn't have any issues, you know, maintenance wise. I mean, yeah, I still get calls here and there for people wanting, you know, their toilet backed up or whatever, something silly. But I got a plumber that I can call and I just go send them over there. But um, yeah, Except I think from your um, two North Carolina properties, are, are they all in Florida close to you? Yes. Yes, they're all in the Broward Would you say it would area. be much harder to would it be much harder to manage the properties if they were in other states? Or would you suggest people like kind of being an expert on a local area? Yeah, I mean, if you're just getting into real estate, why would you go, you know, three states over if you can buy something right next door? So my main goal was to buy as close as I could to where I live because I wanted to manage it. If I had problems, I, I just wanted to be close by. But with the Airbnb, like in North Carolina, I mean, yeah, you can get a management company for 10, 12, 15%, but 
once you run the numbers, like Justin was saying, he, you know, he, I was going to get into percentage what I think uh, profits was because he asked me. You said it was per unit eight hundred dollars. I, I forget what you just said. Yeah, they, like roughly, you know, about eight hundred dollars a month, uh, or maybe it's a year. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so I think I think the the statistic is about a thousand dollars a year per per unit. So for, so repairs, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I mean repairs. That's not really that far off. Um, I would say that's probably a little high. I would say if my twelve unit building, if I spent, uh, I don't know, five grand for the year, uh, is a lot. But remember, I always renovate everything in the beginning when I buy it because I look for value add opportunity stuff that's already distressed that needs renovations. So for me, I, I really don't have a lot of maintenance bills per se. One thing that I just came across recently, I was actually watching another YouTube video and I was like super um, impressed with it was like cost uh, segregation for like writing off of your taxes. Is that something do you do? Like it's like they itemize each individual item on the property and then they mm -hmm. like do depreciate that faster on your properties. I was like, what the heck is this? And then they just... 1031 exchange it and put it into another property and then do the same like oh. depreciate those assets faster are you are you playing that game on all your properties or yes yeah. yes i'm not um i haven't done any uh, too many 1031s mostly because i i don't believe in selling um my rentals i i've always thought i would hold them forever um but yeah i do have an accountant that depreciates everything it's every property is itemized if i had maintenance that year whether i painted the house or i did an interior renovation or whatever it was he, everything is is kept on the books for that i mean some of my tenants pay me in cash you know and you know um yeah <laughs> you, you keep that off the books but um do, do you have I, I like um in the individual companies for or like we have one company that owns all the properties or do you have like different llc's for each one yeah so um, there? yeah i do i try to now remember when you go get conventional loans you have to personally guarantee them and they have to be in your personal name whether if they're single family homes when i say single family i mean a house a duplex a triplex or a fourplex that's all considered single family um, that has to be in your personal name in order to qualify for a bank loan. If you go five units or more, it's asset based and you could purchase that property in an LLC name. Um, you may still personally guarantee the loan, but it'll be in an LLC. But yeah, I have several LLCs set up for different rentals uh, for different reasons. But yeah, it's definitely a, a better way to protect yourself to have your assets in, in a corporation. All right, so if, you know, this is something that Brian and I have been talking about, and, you know, we, we talk about it with some of the guys at the office, is, you know, we want to get into real estate investing ourselves. Say, what are the top, I don't know, two things that you would want to do, or, you know, things you need to be prepared for? I mean, lending aside, you know, your pre-approvals and all that kind of stuff, you know, not don't worry about that. What are the two things that you, you need to have in order to really get started with, you know, buying and starting the rental process? Yeah, I mean, if you've got cash, that's a different story. But a lot of people approach me and say, hey, man, I want to do what you do. How did you get started? Well, if you're starting from zero, yeah, it's very tough. And I started from zero. I literally graduated college. I had seven dollars in my pocket and an ass load of debt. And um, so I started with something called wholesaling, where I would get a property under contract, find another buyer and flip the contract. And I would make, you know, two, three, four, five thousand, ten thousand dollars just assigning paper, essentially, not even owning the property. And then once I built up capital, that's when I started buying for myself. So there's two different ways to enter the market, right? If you have money, that's a different story. I mean, you can just start looking for undervalued opportunities. Like, let's just say in your neighborhood, you know, houses are selling for two hundred thousand. Well, then you probably have to go find one for close to 100 so you can put money into renovations and still have room to flip it or whatever you're going to do with the property. If somebody who doesn't have money, well, then you have to go start asking Uncle Larry or Grandma Thelma for money so that you can start on the market or start with wholesale. So there's two ways to enter into investing. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. I mean, a lot of people that watch this probably, I mean, some of them are going to have a good amount of money and some of them are not. So, you know, 
knowing that is a, I think the best thing that you said there is you started out with the the wholesaling which I think doing that you're also learning the entire market you're actually learning yep. what's a good deal and what's not a good deal and a lot of times you're in touch with the investors and you can kind of see how much money they made on the deal you could you know how much money they actually invested into the property to rehab mm -hmm. it and then how much and then you could even follow back and see what that property is sold for so you are really learning how to you know invest in the property, flip it, and get a good return on it if you're in contact with some of those people that maybe are in your network that you're wholesaling to. So I think yes. that's a really cool way to just yeah. kind of learn about yeah. the process um, before you have the money. And you know what, when you, when you, I just wanna say, when you first get started in something, you're gonna make a lot less money on your first couple of deals than you will on your, la your ladder deals because like you ha always have to leave money on the table. Yeah. Uh, you know, early on because you're learning the game, other people are going to want bigger chunks and, you know, or you're giving these properties to investors who are making more than you, but you still have to be happy with what you're making. So it's a process and yes. uh, it's definitely a grind. I'm, I'm sure you started with nothing. So yeah, I think <laughs> the David hardest Leo's. part though is, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. The, the hardest, the hardest part is finding a good deal, right? Cause there's so many people trying to flip real estate, right? So you, if you found something, then it's pretty easy to find someone to lend the money or someone to partner with you. It's finding the deal right now is the hardest part. I mean, I've always said from day one, like your money is made in the buy. You know, once you get that thing under contract that you're like, oh wow, I got a great deal. Uh, as soon as you have that, even just some networking, if you went to like a local real estate club to start talking to people, hey, I just got this deal there'd be plenty of people that would want to partner with you. At least if for someone who's like experienced like myself, I've done that many, many times. Have you um, invested in other people's deals and, and or, or have you yeah. actually bought yeah, wholesale deals I mean. from other people? Yes, that's what I mean. Like I've had other friends that said, hey, David, I found this house. I, I want to buy it, but I don't know what to do. They know that I'm in real estate. I go look at the deal. I say, oh damn, you got a great deal. How do you want to structure this? I can get the money lined up. I'll get the contractors lined up. Like we'll do the renovations and then we'll split, you know, split profits. So yes, I've done that many times where I've had several people approach me to invest with them. As, as being an investor, what does that split look like? Um, is it a 50, 50 deal? If they bring you the deal and you're investing the money or how does that normally work? I would say that's situational. It's hard to say right now, but if some people can put some skin in the game, yeah, I have no problem going 50-50, but if I'm gonna get everything funded, all the renovations done, and this person's gonna come out with you know nothing out of pocket, then I probably wouldn't split 50-50. There's been occasions yeah. where they brought me the deal and I say, okay, I'll give you a finder's fee. So I, I pay them, we come to an agreed amount, or whatever it is, and I, I pay them a finder's fee, and then I just do the deal myself. But I would say in general, yeah, it's usually 50-50 if they're bringing something to the table. Okay. What kind of cap rates are you looking at right now for to be like, if someone's bringing you a deal, like what makes sense? Is it still at 10% in this crazy market or is it less now? So cap or rate, when you're talking cap rate, I would say cash on cash return. Um, for my rentals, I usually look for somewhere around 15%. Um, for my flips, it's tough to say cash on cash return, but I would say usually about a 25% return. So if you put out, you know, a hundred thousand, you should probably get back, you know, twenty five thousand dollar profit. And that's usually within four to six months. And that's including like a hard money, like you're putting down maybe twenty percent and then Yes. Or twenty cash or thirty percent and then also I always renovations. Use yes. I always use the I'm term not sure that I'm not sure of that term cash on cash. What does that, that mean? So a cash on cash return is okay, if the house costs three hundred thousand and I put you know, 50,000 down and 50,000 to renovate. Well, I didn't pay 300,000, I, I paid 100,000 because that, that was my own money of 100,000, but I borrowed 200, right? So if I put out 100,000 of my own money and I got back 125,000 after everything was done and closed, well then I made 25% on my cash, right? Did I explain that well? Yes, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like that. And and yeah. what kind of time frame are do you usually try to do uh, flips? So the flips are four to six months 
I mean, I've had some go as quick as 30 days, you know, something I just paint and, and relist. Um, but I would say the longest is probably eight months. It's something that you want to get in and get out um, and make the most make the most you can. Have you, uh, and this is, you know, something that we, we do a lot of is side hustle stuff. And, you know, we're on TikTok and we, pe- and we see people put out these TikToks about side hustles. And the one that I'm always seeing is this guy who talks about, you can basically get yourself, you know, a super cheap home by doing a 203K, you know, the, that one, right? Where you, you find the cheapest house in the neighborhood. It needs a lot of work. You get the 203K loan. You, you know, you roll all of the rehab costs into it. Have, do you, have you ever done anything about that? Do you, do you like that model? Do you think it's kind of dispel it or prove it what do you think yeah so i think what you're referring to is the fha uh 203 it's like 203k or 203b loan yeah um yeah there's there's a loan that you can actually get your renovation money funded also i think it only applies to first-time home buyers for fha um so it's something you can do one time so if if i meet somebody that hasn't really bought a property i always suggest getting their FHA loan and trying to get a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex because you can come in with as little money down as possible, as low as three and a half percent to get an FHA, basically Fannie Mae, like government backed loan. And then you can rent out the other three units and you live for free. That, that's probably the best way to start investing is, is with a multifamily FHA loan. Yeah, I've got a buddy who he he does the same thing and he's been telling me for years, you know, just getting started, you know, if you're if this is what you want to do, get a multi unit. He always says, you know, start with the duplex because then you can renovate one while you live in the other and then, you know, flip that around, rent that one out while you renovate the mm-hmm. other side, live in there for, and then like you said, you're basically just living for free. Yep. And then at that point, what most people do, or at least what I did, was refinance and then you pull cash out. And now you have something to work with, right? You just leverage that property. And now you pull out, you know, 50,000, 80,000, whatever you've got on the equity. And then you go buy something else. That That's that's how you make it. Yeah. Uh, what are some of like the biggest challenges in this industry that you've come up against? Um, we already talked about starting with no capital. What are, what are some of the other biggest challenges that you run into in real estate? Oh, man. I think right now the biggest challenge is getting work done. Um, I used to have guys that you know would knock out a project in three, four weeks, and now I've got stuff that lingers on for you know two months. And I call them up and say, "Hey, man, what's what's going on?" Well, I'm so busy. You know, I've got so many projects. Everybody wants work done right now, and and that's true. I mean, there's there's an influx of people who want to renovate even their primary homes. They're spending tons of money putting pools in, kitchens, whatever it is. And so right in right now, the biggest challenge is getting work done on a timely manner. Um, but, you know, you, you just trying to zig and zag, you know, with with this, you know, with the changes. I guess we need to start a contracting company. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> yeah. because it's, it's not only is it the labor, but it's the materials right now as well. Right. Yes. So the materials are very expensive. expensive, hard to find. Yeah. Like have, I have a, have you, a project. Go ahead. I've got a project where I need to uh, diamond bright a pool, like put a new uh, surface uh, uh, surface on the on the pool down here. And the guy says, "Why well, can't I can't get diamond bright? Like it comes from overseas, and I just don't have any." So yeah, getting materials is is tough right now for like special niche things. People don't realize like the pandemic really did put a hinder on on materials. So you say you make money when you buy a deal. Have you ever lost money on a deal? <laughs> People ask me that question all the time, and I've probably done 300 flips, and I've lost money one time. Oh, nice. Nice. I mean, not yeah. nice that you lost money, well, but... What was I mean, the crazy nice. circumstance on that one? So it was a condo. I traditionally don't do condos. The maintenance fee was super high. It was like 600 bucks a month. The renovations took longer than expected. The the renovation cost was higher than expected. It sat on the market longer than I thought it would sit on the market. So I've always erred on the side of caution when I buy the deal. You know, someone will bring me a deal and I say, eh, it's not really a deal. It's probably a deal for somebody else, but not for me. 
Um, so I would say it went sideways because it sat on the market too long and my expenses were too high. I didn't lose a lot of money, a few thousand bucks, but yeah, like Justin said, that's great. I, I've only lost money one time. All right. So we talked about the challenges that you might have faced and, you know, some of those things. What has been the most rewarding aspect of, you know, being either a flipper or, um, you know, working in the, rent, the house rental game? Oh, God. I think the most rewarding is spending time with my family. It's it sounds um, it's not even cliche. It just sounds it's it's like it's, it's so different. Like some of my buddies, they go, get in their car 8 a.m., they drive half an hour downtown, they clock in at their corporate job, and they're home at 6 p.m. Like my kids get out of school at 2 o'clock, and I cannot wait to go pick them up. So like my freedom with this career that I have is, God, second to none. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Yeah. Now, were you doing something before this? You know, what did this be just something you knew? Well, you said you joined this, this kind of industry right out of high school or college, excuse me. So, yeah, do you so do anything as a side hustle or is this basically it? No, I mean, uh, this is I, I graduated um, actually with a meteorology degree and I'm, I'm obviously doing nothing related to meteorology. But <laughs> my one of my one of my family member, my cousin was actually flipping real estate at the time. And he's like, hey, this is the bottom of the market. You know, I want to mentor you and show you what to do. So actually, I was working with my cousin for the first six years of my real estate career. And kudos to him for teaching me everything that he taught me. Um, so I've been doing real estate for 13, now going on 14 years. But I would say, no, I don't really have a huge side hustle. I do trade some stocks here and there. I've done uh, Ethereum um, in and out a few times. Um, but. I think real estate's like my bread and butter and I know it like the back of my hand. So, um, no, I don't have a side hustle, but I did start to get into Airbnbs. I recently bought my first Airbnb in North Carolina. And so that is not necessarily a side hustle. It's just like another aspect of real estate that I haven't done before. Yeah, let's talk about Airbnbs just a little bit. Um, just what's your overall opinion on the market, the short-term rentals? Um, what kind of percentage is more are you getting than like a long-term rental um and would you suggest other people you know getting into that or or focusing just on long-term rentals yeah so like you know long-term rentals um most of my stuff is you know somewhere between 12 and 18 percent return um the airbnbs should fetch you 25 percent um depending on what your management costs are and the location and you know there's a few factors that come into play but yeah you should be able to make more money as an airbnb i mean right now it seems like more people would rather stay in an airbnb as opposed to like a hotel motel experience um i have i have some friends up in gallenberg he owns 29 cabins but they're all five star cabins i mean they're top of the line they've got you know poker tables and foosball and pool tables and you know, super nice decor and they're rented out every day of the year because that clientele that wants that house, the supply is so limited. So my suggestion is if you're going to get into Airbnbs, probably step it up a little notch and have it be a little bit nicer than maybe some of the other Airbnbs that are just kind of meh, you know? Um, and I think you'll definitely see your, your return uh, pan out better than some of the other ones. Now with with Airbnb, now I have a buddy who he's a he's a super host with Airbnb. He's got a couple places in Colorado. Uh, he actually had to pivot his entire strategy during the pandemic because Colorado they actually stopped allowing short term rentals. So you know he yeah. had to say, all right, I got to get long term renters in here. You know, do you know he was trying for like six months, and then you know some of them he had to put into a year, and then go month to month just because we didn't know how long that was going to last. Is that kind of like a, a backup strategy that you've got now that you're just kind of getting into Airbnb is like, all right, say something like that happens again. You know, what's what's my strategy to keep moving forward and collect an income? Yeah, I mean, people always need a place to live and rentals will always be in high demand. Um, but yeah, I do have a lot of friends that were Airbnb -ing 
and they went to you know short term you know three month six month rentals because it was banned i don't think it was just banned in colorado i think it was banned nationwide airbnb okay. um, platform so yeah a lot of people definitely got hit with that and i think a lot of people went that route too they just said stuck a sign on the ground and said hey for rent just to help cover you know all the expenses um but yeah i think you know for me i've already calculated what you know my monthly mortgage is you know and all the expenses and what i think i could rent you know as a monthly tenant so i'll be breaking even or making a couple dollars on top of my rent if if i can't have an airbnb so on the same topic of, of airbnb can you just tell us a little bit about your experience maybe one of your properties that you're doing with airbnb yeah so my north carolina airbnb is super fresh um but my one of my buildings one of my eight unit buildings in fort lauderdale i posted on facebook and i said a new project um should be ready in a you know a few months all right david so someone who's been in the real estate game for 10 plus years you know you've got 25 you know plus rental units what do you make a month uh for someone and this is for someone who's trying to get into it just so that they can know you know what to expect after doing it for several years yeah i mean it didn't happen overnight but um with 25 rental properties you're cash flowing pretty nicely at that point you're probably looking at about twenty thousand a month in uh cash flow um so but it took time to build <laughs> yeah absolutely. obviously yeah yeah that's not that's not a, an overnight thing very yeah. cool um well david thank you so much for joining us today um, yeah you know sure. we, we'll, pos we'll possibly have you on future shows and Maybe, uh, you know, you can critique some of our investments or give us some advice and tips on some properties that we're buying. You'll be our real estate guru. Yeah. So where, yeah, can, yeah. You, what, what do you, where can people find you online if uh, they wanted to check you out or, or possibly send you an email or something? Yeah. Um, you can find me on Instagram um, at David Runnebaum uh, or email too, David Runnebaum at Gmail. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely open to doing another show with you guys. If you want to, I could show you some of my projects. We can do like a walkthrough on um one of my projects that's kind of in the middle of um you know renovations too if you want well, that'd be fun definitely yeah we'll definitely set that up uh thank you so yeah. much for your time uh, yeah. thank you everybody for watching uh we really appreciate it please hit the like and subscribe button and check us out on future real estate videos and deals and we will do our best we can to provide as much value and answer all your questions absolutely all right guys see you next time awesome thanks guys see you later